Hello, everybody. This week's developer session, uh, we will cover this week uh, mainly the, uh, the release process and the developer testing for releases, as well as the deterministic uh, build for yeah, the long-term goal that we get to a deterministic build system. I will hand over already now to Christoph, who is doing the releases, and, uh, and he, together with Devin, are the main guys for testing. And yeah, we'll, they will get in all the details. Oh, thanks, Manfred. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I want to give you a quick uh, overview on the release process. Um, at the moment, the only two who built releases so far was uh, is Manfred. He did it quite for a long time, and I took over. I think uh, for the last, I think five or so releases. Uh, but um, we, we want. I think Manfred just mentioned it quickly. We want to push uh, to deterministic builds. Uh, not only so we do have it already for the char file itself, to the Java char file, uh, but we want to have it for all our binaries we are creating as well. Um, so to be able to do that, um, I think it's, it's, it's a good idea um, to everyone who wants um, to work on, on, on this, um, uh, has an idea how, how it, it's going right now. So you can work from the current release process uh, to, to work for the deterministic build um, on a broader range. So um, I will do a, uh, share now my screen. Um, Peter, I will just quickly mute you uh, because you got some sound in. Um, so let me just quickly switch to the release process. Okay. Um, um, Manf Manfred, uh, could you uh, push my, uh, my screen to present to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, I've recently added, so actually I wanted to have it as a kind of draft pull request, a work in progress, but it was merged uh, by mistake um, a couple of days ago. So we have it already in the main repository. That's just a quick hint. Um, uh, GitHub um, recently introduced draft pull requests. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you create a kind of a work in progress pull request and you set it to draft, then it's not uh, possible to merge it by mistake. So uh, that's that's something that I will keep in mind for the future, um, so we don't have to have this issue. But back to the release process. Um, yeah, um, at the moment, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I'm doing the releases right now. Uh, I want to give you a, a high-level overview. I, I, I'm not going into very much detail. Um, if someone is interested, uh, we can do follow-up uh, follow-up presentations. But yeah, I want to start with the high 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 level uh, overview first. So before every release, um, I'm updating the translations. Uh, we do the translations on TransFX. So um, what needs to be done, uh, I'm switching to the translation process markdown. Uh, what needs to be done is uh, to synchronize the existing translation files. For that, um, you need to uh, you don't need to, but it makes it easier if you install the, the command line tool uh, from TransFX, because if you do that, um, there is already a pre-configured configuration file for, for this client in the core, core repository. And there is a um, um, little shell script that it's, is downloading uh, the translation files of, of all our supported languages and moves and renames and moves them into the right directory. So, uh, so that's that's the, the first um, step uh, that needs to be done before uh, you you are able to re release a new version. Um, the second point, uh, what we always update uh, update is the, the are the data data stores. So we have quite a, a bit of them um, already. Um, there is also a, a little shell script. I'm just switching to it uh, so you see what it's part of. So uh, until recently, before we had the, the, the testnet um, set up for, for testing the DAO, uh, we only copied um, two stores, the trade statistics uh, store and the account age witness store. Um, before you uh, are able to run the script to copy it over, you have to start up your BIS client, wait until it's fully synchronized, and then you just copy over. The, the data stores. Um, after each of, of these um, two 
updating um, steps. You commit, of course, to the to the repository just locally. Um, the next point is might be something that I will do later uh, in the in the future. But at the moment, um, I'm doing it as as a next step. S sorry. Marfa, do you uh, want to point something out? Yeah, yeah I, maybe I just give a little bit of background regarding the data store uh, files. <clears throat> also, uh, yeah, we have this trade statistic. So when people are trading, they are both uh, publishing a trade statistic uh, data object to the peer-to-peer -peer network and that get stored at every client. So it's a append-only data structure where all the time it's growing and it has already something like five megabytes. And to avoid that you are downloading all these 20 to 2,000 uh, trades, uh, uh, yeah, we are shipping it with every new release because otherwise the seed node would need to send you all this data and then you need to process it. And yeah, to avoid all this, to make it uh, faster, we are shipping it with every new release. So every yeah, when a new user is downloading it, he's only requesting the data which is missing from the latest release date to the time when he downloaded it. That's usually not more like a month. So we are, it's just a kind of like a improvement. And for the DAO, there are a few more data which are also similar data structure. But those are the data which really get persisted to disk and get and growing over time. And yeah, to improve performance and usability for that, we are, we are packing it to the, the binary. Um, there's one thing I missed, Manfred, maybe you can uh, talk about that as well, uh, regarding the, the Bitcoin J, where we have also, where we also uh, update from time to time. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's a little bit similar as a checkpoint file, which contains, as far as I'm not 100% I'm sure about this, <coughs> which data actually is in there, <coughs> but I think it's basically all the block headers from the yeah, from the blockchain until this point when the checkpoint file gets created. And when we have seen it at one release in, in autumn when we had a very long break, an unusual long break of something like three months before the 09 release, uh, people had, when they started, downloaded BISC, uh, they got already, um, the checkpoint file was quite old, it was more than a year old. And the initial download took quite uh, uh, quite long time, and the CPU were under under heavy load because yeah, Bitcoin J was doing too much work. And to avoid this, I mean, there will not be big reorgs that the blockchain would be a real for a thousand blocks or whatever. So there's no real risk with this. I mean, it's a little bit of trust issue. You have to trust basically the business developers that they are not. Omitting some transaction, you cannot lie about this, but it's a very high, uh, very low risk, uh, and it improves a lot of um, of the user experience when they're downloading BISC that they don't need to download too much block headers from the network and can get Bitcoin J faster and, and more lightweight to run. And that's all. actually, I think now we should also try to update it with every release. You have to run a, a tool as a wallet tool in, uh, in the Bitcoin J library but it's quite simple and um, yeah when when it's updated then we have basically always the best performance for the user when he downloads a new application um manfred maybe that's also one thing that you could add uh, to this document because un until now um, i haven't done um, the bitcoin j update on myself yet so it, you always did it um, yeah I will, and if you will. put it there i can do it uh -huh. myself yeah uh -huh. um yeah, uh, regarding writing the release notes, it's it's kind of a manual process. So we, we do need the release notes um, in the GitHub release. Uh, we need it uh, for the web page, and we need it for the in-app um, message that we send out. To make it easier uh, to write the release notes, uh, you can use a short log. Um, I've put down um, a, a little uh, script. Uh, I copied it over uh, from, from the Bitcoin guys. I didn't use short log before, but it's a really great tool, uh, I found out, uh, also the git log. Um, so, uh, but in, in general, it will be a manual process. Uh, for that, just um, a little hint, it would be great if, if every pull request that is submitted um, to our repository um, is as good so that I can, in the end, just copy and paste uh, the 
the description, the title of the pull request um, to the release notes. So at the moment, I'm, I'm rewriting it uh, every now and then. Uh, sometimes we have pull requests that contain lots of commits. So I have to get in, uh, go into the pull request, look at the commit messages, and to find out what it's, it's about. So uh, we should um, thrive for um, having pull requests and titles that are so good uh, and user-facing um, that I um, can, in best case scenario, just copy it over um, to the um, um, the um, to the log to the to the release notes, and and I'm done with it. What we can also do um, uh, in the future, I, I didn't do it uh, now um, in much detail, that we tag the pull requests more properly as well. So I can then group already the, the pull requests uh, based on the tags. Um, and yeah, it's so in the end, the, the, the goal should be that I can just run a script and, and generate the release notes uh, without doing any manual work. But at the moment, it's, it's lots, of, lots of manual work. Yeah, let's maybe make it directly more strict from now on that, uh, I mean, we both are the, the, <coughs> the maintainers who are doing the merging that when we merge, that we always assign a tag and that we are rewriting the title if it's not matching and, and mention it to the developer who's done the pull request to use a better title in the future and not accepting pull requests which are too big point. I mean, they are a pain in the ass to review and they add a lot of risk. I mean, there are some exceptions, of course, like the redesign and the DAO or whatever. But normal feature <clears throat> pull request should only handle one feature. And if they are mixing different features, we should reject it. And the developer has to break it up again and make a new pull request, which is isolating the features. Yeah. I mean, of course, there are some exceptions like cleaning up or so before the release. We have often a yeah, bug fixing it and it do smaller. But I think for a normal feature okay. pull request, they always should be descriptive for the, from the user point of view. What, what does it mean for the user? And um, and to have them as as good that we can use it directly in the release notes. Yeah, what we can do uh, for a pull request that shouldn't be included in the release notes, like the cleanup stuff. So uh, if we just don't tag any pull request, uh, then then we then it's just not included in the release notes. So we we come up with a couple of uh, tags that are basically the sections in the release notes, mm -hmm. and I will query uh, for all of them. And yeah, I, I will just take take what what's in there, and if there are some pull requests that were just cleanups, refactoring stuff that we don't want to have in the release notes, then we just don't tag it, and uh, yeah, then it doesn't matter. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, very good idea. Yeah, very good idea. And then from now on, let's uh, every time when we merge, we are signing a tag, and from the next release on, you should have it clean then. And I will also stop the prefix with DAO. I just use send attack instead of this and rename the, the DAO pull request also in the way that it's clear uh, without this DAO prefix. Uh, I use this, this replacement for the attack, but the attack make, make much more sense, of course. Yeah, yeah. That, that, I guess um, that would be a great help because that's one of the most time consuming uh, tasks of, of every release, just coming up with the proper release notes. Um, yeah, let's let's get. Um, if you have set up that, um, there is of course uh, there's some changes that need to be done on the web page, so you can prepare the pull request up front. I, I won't go into very much detail what needs to be changed. Uh, it's basically version number changes. Uh, you have to up, update uh, currency lists. Um, um, if there is a tool available, um, I, I linked it already. So we cr I created a, a small. Uh, tool that just generates the HTML content that it's necessary. So you can just copy over stuff. Yeah. And yeah, the release notes are also required um, for the roadmap. Yeah. Let's switch to the basic preparations. So um, in general, um, as we are creating at the moment builds for uh, Mac OS, for Windows, for Linux, we do um, have uh, the DEB package um, for Debian-based uh, distributions. And um, we have, since uh, this release, we have also Red Hat-based uh, um, uh, RPM packages. So that's uh, what is needed. Um, if, you, if you want to be able to build these uh, binary files, you need um, um, a macOS system. 
you need a, a Windows machine. Uh, you need uh, at least one Linux um, uh, um, machine. Um, I use Ubuntu at the moment. Um, I, I also use uh, uh, virtual machines um, right now, so I, I don't have uh, real installations of it. Um, so yeah, but uh, if you want to to be able to build uh, the release, then you need all this. Uh, Operation operating systems uh, available. Of course, um, what we do, what I do before every release, um, installing latest security updates, patches um, for all uh, OSs except of Windows. That's it, basically. For Windows, uh, we also need to um, do antivirus scans and updates, so everything is uh, super clean. Clean uh, for uh, creating the builds. Yeah, Manfred. Uh, there is uh, one small thing to add, maybe here. Uh, as we are building the way that uh, the the char, the char file is creating on one operating system, and then it's used for just packaging on the on the target operating systems. There, I think there have been once discussion, or we had once uh, a change in the build system where we uh, built the full. A char file also on the operating systems. I'm not 100% sure if the char file is then deterministic. I think the char file should be already now deterministic, and we're creating a hash and publishing the hash. So that's in the, in the GitHub release page. There is a hash of the char file published, so anybody could build basically the char file and can check if the hash is the same. Uh, it's not much tested, but at least when I did it, it was working uh, for me. That um, I could yeah, uh, run the build a few times. It was always exactly the same hash. But I assume or I can imagine that when we would move to a system where the char files are built on the other operating systems as well, that there might be slight differences in the JVM or whatever, and the char file might be different. So, And I'm not sure if it would add any benefit. I assume it's basically a yeah, Jarvis cross platform. So it should work like we have it now. and it. It reduce uh, build time. Uh, yeah, just basically want to mention it when somebody's surprised about this file and uh, not much information out about this. It's just that you can uh, the char file build. I mean, it's not the full binary because for this we don't have a deterministic build yet, but the char file should be already deterministic because it's stripping out all the variable stuff like timestamps and so on. And uh, yeah, it's, as far as I'm aware, it should work. Yeah, I, I haven't tried out myself uh, to to do the the the, the full builds um, on on each operating system. Uh, Devin just um, created a script for that, so at the moment I, I do it uh, as Manfred was um, describing. So um, I, I built a release on on the macOS system. So before you are able to to build um, the version, you have to update the version number, uh, as it's um, not an really just a final replace so you have to take care a little bit um, so I created um, a little shell script where you just need to uh, to change the variable and it will then replace the, the right files um, after you have uh, update updated the version number um, there's one step it's kind of a one-time setup um, as we sign um, all uh, uh, created files in the end uh, you have to uh, assign an um, environment variable uh, with the, the your G, um, PGP uh, email address, uh, which is uh, registered on your local machine. Um, but you just have to do it once. Um, uh, what you also need to do um, is, as we create, we start the build on macOS, so we create the char file, um, and the char file is then copied over um, reused on all other systems. As, as my setup is uh, with virtual machines, uh, I have shared folders, and um, the VAM path variable uh, needs to be updated depending uh, on your local setup. So if you have set up uh, that, uh, then you can uh, create the app, uh, run the create apps uh, script uh, within the macOS package directory. Uh, what will be created is um, the, the DMG, the, the macOS uh, installer file, uh, and the, the char file Manfred uh, uh, mentioned, the deterministic uh, fat char. So it's kind of uh, bundled with everything that's, that is needed uh, to, to run it. So 
you don't need to have uh, um, Java installed on your machine. Uh, it, we uh, include it in, in our binaries already. Um, yeah, Manfred? Do you want to say something about the code signing in uh, OS X and the plans for Windows? Yeah, on OS X, um, uh, I'm signing um, the, the binary with my certificate. Um, so I have a developer certificate that signs it. Um, there's one further step that we want to get into is, um, I think it's um, for Mo, Mojave, Mojave. Uh, you can also um, upload or let your final installer file be signed by Apple as well. Uh, which would then um, uh, show a le a one le less war warning when you install it. So that's one thing that it's still missing. And uh, for a deterministic um, uh, binary inst or macOS installer, uh, we, we would need to have an unsigned uh, package. Um, we talked uh, shortly before um, the, the call, and I just remembered um, for building for doing this for mobile applications, there is a solution because I, I, I used it already. So you, to the, for mobile, it, it's possible for, for Apple to create a, uh, uh, a binary uh, without signing and then just uh, sign it uh, afterwards. So I, I guess maybe uh, there's an easy way to do this uh, also for, for desktop uh, um, installers. I just didn't, didn't try it out myself and how it's, possible to do this um, uh, with the Java Packager. I guess uh, it's also possible to, to remove the, the, the signing part after, uh, after you have created the, the DMG with Java Packager. Maybe, maybe, maybe that could work. Manfred, is there anything else you wanted to, to add on? Yeah, so I also don't know how to solve this uh, signing problem. <clears throat> But I can imagine that either you are providing their signature for the unsigned installer and people will have to create a DMG with, yeah, without the signature and then can compare it. I think that's a little bit weak because uh, somehow the file what you download have then at the end a different hash and so on. And probably another approach could be that you can filter it out that you are <coughs> signing everything besides the signature in the in the in, uh, in the packaged file and uh, for verifying we probably need then another tool where people are using it for verifying the signature and that also excludes the signature and I think then it should work then as, as long as you trust this tool for uh, for checking the signature uh, I think it should be then easy to, to use and it really uses then the file what you're downloading and not, not a different file, which is yeah probably a, another risk surface. But uh, when we get closer to the deterministic, I mean, in Bitcoin Core, they have found a solution because they're doing this and uh, it's also signed. Uh, so yeah, it's doable somehow. It's a little bit tricky, of course, to do it the right way and the most secure way, but uh, need to get yeah. deep into this. Yeah, we, we just have to see how, how it works with our tool set with the Java packager and so on. But yeah, I also think it, it must be doable somehow. It's uh, just a matter of, of resources at the moment. Um, yeah, so um, if you have created um, the DMG and the deterministic char on, on, on macOS, uh, then you can uh, start up, uh, for example, your Linux machine. Um, and there's um, uh, a script that is copied over in the shared folder. It's the package um, script, uh, which you could uh, then just uh, um, run on the Linux um, machine. And it creates, in the end, uh, the DEB and the RPM file. And what, what you should do afterwards uh, is just install it, try it out if it works. Uh, the same, of course, is, uh, goes for the, the macOS um, package. Um, we always install it, uh, try it out, do some smoke testing on each distribution if, if uh, something's broken. Um, after having the Linux build finished, um, we do the same for Windows. Uh, so there is a package but script um, available that you can just run uh, to generate the, the, the Windows uh, installer. Uh, on Windows, um, com uh, um, 
is, there's a difference um, to Mac. On Mac, we, we sign the installer with uh, my developer certificate. On Windows, uh, we haven't, uh, haven't uh, set up uh, the process for, for signing the, the created uh, executable. So uh, if, if you are familiar with that, uh, that's also one thing uh, that would, would help to improve uh, the, the experience for Windows users to, to communicate the trust, uh, as, many, as much trust as possible. Um, yeah, so if you're familiar with that, uh, with signing um, executables on Windows, um, feel free to contact us, yeah. Yeah, actually, I think we really should uh, prioritize this. It's already a long time on the, on the to-do list. And I, <clears throat> I started to do it once, but uh, I think I always had at the end find uh, a little bit uh, problems to get the, uh, the, the code certificate. Um, it's... It's basically similar, like a certificate for, for a web page, HTTPS certificate, costs a little bit more usually, but it's not really a complicated process. And I think it's just uh, extra script what you need to run at the end. And it's the main process is, yeah, you have to buy the certificate and to get this and you need to do all the uh, verification, okay, KYC we'll with the ver uh, certificate authority company and, and that's it. But I think it really would be good because especially on Windows, it's a little bit of pain in the ass with installing when you have the default settings, operating system settings, then it doesn't let you install and you have to change it and so on. And, uh, yeah. and maybe yeah. also some, some antivirus software is reacting differently. I don't know, Devin probably will know more about this, but we get sometimes uh, problems that they're lacking a uh, disk because of Tor uh, as a, a false positive as a malware and maybe Windows signing could decrease the risk for getting flagged. Um, I think we really should put it on our prior list for the next releases as well. Yeah, it make, also makes sense because most of our downloads uh, are from Windows machines. Uh, so yeah, so it, it's, it's, it's uh, the, yeah. our biggest ins, ins, install group uh, based on, on, on the ones who install the, the installer. Yeah, and those who are most vulnerable because they're most, uh, the most vulnerable system, they are of course doing not the <coughs> The, uh, the verification process with, I mean, when you're downloading the, in the application itself from BISC, you are doing all the verification uh, with checking the other, uh, the PGP sign signature. <coughs> but uh, those people who are usually downloading and doing manually their, their checks are the Linux users, which are the least exposed to risks. So of course, yeah, I think we should take care to give the Windows user a little bit more security by adding a Windows certificate in the build process. Yeah, makes, makes absolutely sense. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah, me Devin, now? Okay, yeah, okay. perfect. I finally got my microphone working. I had <laughs> to struggle. But uh, uh, just uh, just listening in on, on the last comment that you, you, that you were having about uh, signing the uh, Windows executable, um, I I have an issue open. It's actually assigned to me. I did a little bit of initial investigation um, on on how uh, Bitcoin Core does it, and they, they actually have a um, they, they've basically created an association. Um, I, I think it's called Bitcoin Core Code Signing uh, .org or something like that, and and it's basically just a group of some of the core developers that have gotten together and uh, registered uh, for the signing certificate on, on Windows. Um, I have uh, I can I can post a link to um, the open issue. Um, yes, I remember this. It sounds like the the right way to do it. I'm not just sure if we, it will delay at the end. At the end, you need a lawyer, you need to set up a foundation. It creates some point of a legal entity, probably not the really critical one, but basically we want to avoid. I mean, the other alternative would be that just uh, like the Apple certificate is just held by the developer who is doing the release process. There should be anyway several developers who can do it. At the moment, it's Christoph and me, but our... <clears throat> Uh, would be good then basically that several people have this um, certificate. It's not super expensive, I don't remember the price, but something like $400 or even, yeah, I think it's more expensive like the Apple. The Apple, I think it's $100 a year. 
And I think the code signing is two or three hundred or four hundred dollar a year. But at the end, it's part of the compensation request, so you get uh, get it paid from the DAO. <coughs> and I have the feeling it's somehow easier to do it just that the developer is is uh, is doing this. And of course, long term, it would be probably a more clean process to have kind of like a foundation who is who is carrying this. I just fear when we, um, yeah, I mean, the steps to get the foundation is another process, which is not really trivial. And uh, then, yeah, who is part of the foundation? Yeah, you need a lawyer in which country? It's, it's a lot of effort to get this done. It costs much more, for sure, much more money, at least in Switzerland. You pay easily five or ten thousand just to get a foundation set up with a lawyer or even more. So I fear for a short term solution, maybe it's better to just go the easy way that the developer is setting up the certificate. Yeah, maybe, maybe Darren, Darren, we we can um, get together and and try to 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 walk uh, walk through the process itself. So uh, the, the certification to getting the certificate, uh, I can do myself. Um, if it, I guess it's hopefully properly uh, uh, descri uh, described on the on the Venus website. But yeah, afterwards uh, the the signing process. It would be great if you could could help out uh, on on updating the the build scripts accordingly. Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, Devin, uh, do you have uh, any uh, reservations against what uh, my response to not use a foundation at least at the moment, and maybe put it a little bit more on the midterm? Roadmap. No, no, I, I I totally agree with that. Uh, I'm I'm on board with that. Makes sense to me. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um. Actually, um. Af after creating the the Venus builds, um. There's um. The next step is to to sign all the generated files. Uh. For that, we have the the finalized script. Um. So we do this the the, the final signing on, on Mac OS at the moment. Um, so it, it generates then um, it uh, for for every uh, installer file uh, the, the the signature um, and there's also the the signature keys of uh, the three people uh, included uh, in the build uh, who, who are allowed to create a build. So it's Manfred, Chris, and myself. So if someone else wants to create an official build that works, uh, that is also um, then update able uh, of the current release. Uh, there has to be its um, signature has to be included in the release before. Manfred, can can you um, just um, say if I'm saying something yeah. wrong? No, uh, maybe give you a little a bit of overview about this in-app downloader works. So when you are downloading the application inside of the BISC application, you get the notification, there's a new version, and then you click download. <coughs> you are downloading all these uh, signature keys. You are downloading the, the signature files and the binary, and you are doing the uh, verification inside of the BISC app. And in the BISC app, we are shipping the keys are from the developers. So when somebody would manage to hack our GitHub account and change the keys and their signatures, it will be still detected. Uh, so it's it's more safe like doing it manually from GitHub because, yeah, as I said, when somebody would manage to hack our GitHub account, then uh, it's still vulnerable, but it would be detected when you are uh, doing the download in the application. And as far as we have seen from the statistics, it seems that many people are using the in-app download tool and it just gives you more security and you don't need to do it. I mean, you can do it additionally with a command line when you want to be extra secure, but it's more convenient and especially for the Windows users who are usually not so familiar with uh, doing using the, the terminal, uh, they get it <coughs> automatically uh, verified. So I think that's the recommended path to do to update. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Manfred. Um, yeah, so after signing all, all of the files, um, we we run a, a virus scan again uh, over all, all files generated on, on the Windows machine, just to be sure that we uh, don't have any issues with antivirus software. Uh, what we also do um, now for the second time, we did it now for the second time, uh, we also 
scanned um, all uh, all of the files uh, with an online service. It's, it's uh, virustotal.com, uh, which um, scans the files uh, with, um, I think, 20, 30 something um, antivirus uh, software. So we, we can be quite sure that we don't have any issues uh, with any virus software, antivirus software out there. Um, yeah, so if, if that is done, then there is uh, one final test to be made uh, to do at least uh, one mainnet test trait. Um, we do testing upfront, of course, uh, before the release process starts, but after the release is created, uh, we, we still want to make sure that the, the binaries created also uh, work without any problems. So we need to do some smoke testing and, and live trades. Um, after the final test, it's uh, you are ready to to, co uh, to commit uh, the, the, the version number changes I, I mentioned in the beginning. Um, we create a, a tag for the release. Um, afterwards, we revert back to, to snapshot version numbers uh, wherever necessary, uh, as this is kind of not a kind of simple final replace. Uh, I also created a, a quick shell script to run this um, so you don't make any mistakes or I make, don't make any mistakes. Um, and afterwards, uh, you just need to push all the tags and, and commits you, you have created to the master repository. So, so that's, um, for, that's the basic uh, release process. So now um, it's kind of the publication of the release on GitHub. Um, yeah, of course, you should check the fingerprint of the PGP key that was used. Uh, that has to be uh, um, put into the signing key file. Um, after all, uh, after, uh, let me just quickly see if I missed anything. Yeah, so um, on GitHub, uh, you then have to create a release um, with the release notes, um, upload all the generated files, um, check all the files with virustotal.com. Also, you could also upload them um, to virustotal uh, first and then upload them on GitHub. But as it yeah takes uh, quite uh, quite some time to do that, uh, I'm normally uh, creating a draft release, up uploading the, the files, and then just uh, pointing to the the GitHub um, CDN uh, URLs of, of the files and check them afterwards in virus total. So it saves some time. Um, in the future, we could also try to uh, automate that. Um, yeah, then you just have to select the release tag that you just pushed before. And yeah, you release on GitHub. Uh, at that point, um, people are able to, to download it directly from GitHub um, and it would, would work as expected. Uh, but what we want to do also is to, to push it to everyone who is already, uh, has already installed uh, the, the BIS client. Um, for that, uh, we, yeah, um, uh, what I forgot to mention, of course, you should uh, add uh, the information to the old GitHub releases that the new version is available. And so that we have it available on the website as well. Now is the time to, to merge the, the web page pull request and check if everything is uh, um, working as expected on the website as well. Uh, to be able to, to push uh, the update message uh, from a BIS client, you have to, up to, to start your client. Uh, you can open the, the messaging tool with com, uh, command or control M, depending on your operating system. Um, to be able to, to send out this message, uh, you need a, a key as well, uh, which is private. Um, yeah, as you, you, we normally put in to this message, not the full release notes, as it would just be too much information for the message. So we just uh, take, uh, a smaller part, normally I take the, the first um, just notable changes part from the release notes and send out the, the update message. As, uh, you all, I also then just wait uh, for some time to, to have a good propagation in the network. Uh, and after that, uh, you should do a backup of the, the app directory just to be sure. Yeah, after that, Basically, everything is done that needs to be done besides communication. So um, we, we post it on Slack, uh, in the forum. Um, if everything looks fine, we can also then just post it on any other 
uh, channel that we have available. Um, for the Arc uh, um, Linux um, release, um, it's it's um, it's necessary to to ping Florian to to update to update it. So that's not not something that I normally do. So that's that's uh, done by Florian. Yeah, and of course afterwards, after each release, it's it's imp very important to to celebrate a little bit as the the process to as you see the process uh, for each release. Is isn't that short, so it's it's really worth celebrating every release, and I'm I'm quite happy that uh, we are now having a, a good uh, once a month uh, uh, rhythm in 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 releasing new versions of the client. Yeah, and it it absolutely makes sense to release at least once a month because uh, as more and more contributors uh, are getting on board. Uh, yeah, we, we get so, so much changes, so many changes into each release. So just uh, creating the release notes uh, would just be too much, <laughs> too much change um, to to do it just every couple of months. And of course, we want to to push out as as usable packages of, of changes as possible. So uh, we can we don't have this huge testing cycles. And yeah, I'll let people get the, the latest features. As soon as possible. Uh, talking about uh, testing, that's something that uh, takes place before the release process is starting. I will now stop um, uh, quickly. No, actually, I, I will keep my, my screen sharing because um, uh, we will. No, I will stop screen sharing. Just a sec. Um, fire. So. Yeah, um, yeah. The, as I mentioned already, the the testing uh, for the release uh, happens before the re uh, release process. Um, until now, we um, to make it easier uh, to manage the, the release process, the testing process itself, uh, we used a tool called Test Quality. Uh, before Test Quality, uh, we used a, a simple spreadsheet, um, which was more and more getting less maintainable uh, as more people got involved, the test scenarios got getting more and more. So that was the reason why we switched to test quality, which um, uh, has a, a free plan as well. Um, but as, as we didn't get so, so much participation um, uh, in test quality, test quality is a very powerful tool. It has a lot of features. Um, Devin is, is more familiar with that as he is a, um, a, a QA uh, engineer. Um, but um, I recently did, did some research if, if, if there's, there might be a, a tool available that is not so complicated, uh, especially for people who are not, uh, not used to, do, to use um, QA systems. As I personally I, I worked with lots of QA systems in the past, so it, it wasn't a big deal. But um, we want to get um, as many testers on board as possible. So uh, we were. I was looking around uh, for a tool that is le um, less um, complicated um, than test quality, and I found TestPad, uh, which actually doesn't have a, a free plan. It's a it's a paid uh, paid software. But um, luckily, Steph, uh, the the developer of TestPad, uh, gave us a, a free license um, as we are open source project, and he likes what we're doing. So thanks, Steph, if you're watching that. Um, yeah, and luckily Devin already uh, looked into this software quite a lot and um, and created some test scenarios. Um, maybe Devin, um, can can you uh, take over uh, at this point and do a screen sharing and explain the tool? Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Perfect. Okay, can you see my screen? Um, Manfred, can you uh, yeah. present it to yeah. everyone? I think it's whistleblower. I see it at least. Do you see it? Um, I don't have it. Let me just quickly. Okay, sorry, I have it. Thanks. Okay, yeah, so you should be able to see uh, TestPad. Uh, so, so like Christoph was saying, um, uh, Testpad is is our, is our new uh, test management tool that we're we're actually going to give a, a test or give it a try for our next release uh, 095. So what I've done is I've set up some um, I guess they're called folders um, in in 
in the application here, and I, I've sort of structured it um, by uh, functional area. A few of these I've actually just copied over from uh, from test quality, but this one here, this DAO governance, is actually one. Uh, it's a new one that I've just started implementing, um, and it, it's sort of a a familiar interface if you're used to just spreadsheets. Um, in, in the sense that uh, this main document that they basically refer to it as a script and it allows you to um, define all of your, basically your actions within uh, this particular uh, testable area. Um, it, it also even allows you to group um, similar tests uh, by section headers. Uh, so these are all uh, section headers. So right now I've got it um, uh, split up by different types of requests and, and proposals that you can uh, generate um, uh, through uh, the governance process. And um, if we expand them all, uh, I'm actually just sort of playing around with the um, the style and the implement implementation of the actual uh, tests themselves, but I've, I've sort of um, started using the the BDD um, style approach using uh, given when then. Um, I, I don't know if that's a little too um, complex, um, but I mean it, it reads pretty straightforward. So I'm I'm assuming it should be fairly easy for any non um, QA or not non tester orientated people to to pick up on fairly easily. Um, so, for instance, for this first uh, test here, where you're submitting a compensation request, um, you, you can see that um, it, it's fairly straightforward. So you, it's given uh, Bob and Alice are online, and the voting cycle is in the proposal phase. Um, when is basically your your action? So so the given is basically your um, your arrange or your setup, um, when is basically your act or your action that you're performing, and then then is what you're actually verifying. And this is the actual the, the item that you're actually um, adding a test result to, so whether it passed or failed. And I, I can actually go over that um, in a second, um, how you actually record your, your test results. Yeah, regarding the, the wording, uh, what, what are you guys thinking about uh, doing it uh, as, as Devin was explaining it with the BDT style? Yes, the, it's very good one. The, the alternative approach is basically just to put sort of comment blocks here. So you could do something like um, uh, step one, uh, do this, um, step two, uh, do that. And then this would be your re result uh, check that this uh, occurred, right? Um, For me, it sounds good. Just a, a to, uh, <clears throat> I mean, this is basically quite a simple test, but it's already missing something. <clears throat> uh, also, when Alice uh, is creating her compensation, her proposal. There, it will not be visible to Bob immediately, only when it's confirmed, when the transaction is confirmed. Only at Alice it's visible, but at Bob only after the next blockchain. And, and I can imagine there are other tests which have more complexities like this, and I'm not sure how it would look like when you have all this extra information added, because then you have maybe five ants or whatever, that you have more complex uh, preconditions or e extra cases here, like here. Yeah, Alice, here it would be basically more correct when you say, yeah, Alice, then Alice will see it immediately. Or, and in the next block, in the next blockchain confirmation, Bob will see it as well, or anybody else. Or, so I'm not sure if this uh, style works also very good when it's, uh, yeah, when it's more complex uh, test scenarios or test, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Setup. Yeah, I think that it works really well because um, with uh, every single given you have separate constraint and it's very easy to, to tell you what are the preconditions. And if you would to put all those preconditions in one sentence on, or just group them, 
uh, as you like, it would be less readable. So this is a really cool convention and um, makes it a bit stiffer, but uh, more clearer. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There are some cases where the either the, the preconditions or the ex expected results are uh, lead, need a little bit more uh, details and they're a little more complex. And, and I mean, um, we can split them up. Like um, you could you could have one really long um, then sentence, or you can split it up into multiple ands. But um, yeah, I, I, I mean, there there probably are a few more. Um, things that need to be checked. I mean, th this is still sort of a work in progress, um, these particular uh, test cases, but um, yeah, I think we, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think we, we just have to try it out uh, to see if, if, if it works. And, and I think, um, yeah, compared um, to, to what we had before, it should be less, less complicated, so easier to test. Um, there's another thing um that changes uh with testbed so uh we we have a possibility uh to invite people to to test without doing any registration so you can send out kind of test links um uh, people can pick up or we we or we decide okay you ask who wants to, to do testing and then we create a test link uh, name it uh, as the user and then give him the link and he just clicks on it and he it will start testing it immediately. Yeah, that's very good. And can people ask for from their side as well that uh, they want to request to get added? But they, sorry, Devin. Oh, I was just going to say I, I'm not really sure. I, I haven't actually tried that. Uh, I think you might be a little more familiar with that side. Yeah. Uh, so uh, requesting, uh, uh, there's no. The real, so I, I can add users. So if there's also the concept of, of, of real users uh, within the client at the moment, there's just two users, there's Devin and, and myself. Uh, for all other testers, um, it is not really necessary. People, uh, but to, to, to have the possibility, I don't think it's possible that kind of guest testers request a link and get it automatically. So it's kind of a, still a manual process for someone, Devin or myself, uh, need to create this uh, guest link uh, manually, but yeah, I, I'm not sure if if it's if it's a immediate uh, use case that we have so many people who, who want to to do testing. At the moment, it would be more on the in the testing channel or a dev channel. People say, yeah, I, I want to to test the, the release, and yeah, we create uh, links and send it out. Oh, or Manfred, what was the process you were looking for? No, no, it just should be. Version. It was a little bit of a painful process to get uh, to get added, and uh, I don't remember exactly, but it was a little bit of friction. So it should be as frictionless as possible. But I think it's good enough when somebody on Slack said, "Hey, I want to help testing. How can I do it?" And you add him and send him a link, and that's it. <coughs> uh, but the users are basically by the username, then, or are they just like anonymous guests? Um, you, you can you can uh, give it a name, so you yeah. can can give each each guest uh, a name in in the column. So so it's easier yeah. than also there's also in the end kind of a report that can be created and we can uh, publish it in a I don't know if it's in a BISC maintainer um, uh, report, so people can referencing it for the conversation requests. Yeah, exactly. And there yeah. there will be their names, and there you see uh, what what cases they they tested yeah. and which not. Because yeah, I think we should just should use usernames or the Slack username or whatever, <coughs> and and then use it. Or, I mean, testing is work and it's up for compensation, of course. And it should include then the report that we can see who has tested what and how much, and uh, and we yeah we really should push the developers that every developer is testing at least his features and maybe a little bit more that the burden on testing is not only on on Christoph and on Devin. Yeah, uh, Manfred, do you see the screen? Uh, Devin is. Um, yeah, sure. I see the screen. So, so that of course there are no 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 test cases executed right now. But if they would be executed in the report, then you would see exactly for each test case who ran it uh, with what operating system and so on. Sorry, Devin. Yeah, so I 
I, I can briefly go over that. Um, you basically, you can add uh, multiple test runs here. Um, so like if you wanted to test on different um, operating systems or, or whatnot, um, you can add a new run here, right? And you can assign it to a particular um, user if you wanted to. Um, so in this case, uh, this one's assigned to Christoph, right? And um, to, to actually go through the, the uh, to execute the test, you just hit the play icon and it'll walk you through each of the um, uh, each of the individual steps. Um, and you can add comments, um, uh, this didn't work or whatever. Um, you can also link to a, a bug on GitHub. Um, if you filed a bug, um, you can fail it. You can pass them, whatever, and then it'll tell you, it'll basically show you at the top a summary, um, like a count of uh, eight um, out of 38 tests were run. And it'll show you, it'll show you a check mark next to each of the, the tests here. And you can actually, so, so like if this one is on, uh, let's say this one, I'm testing this on Windows and uh, this one fails and i wanted to retest there is a uh, there's actually a retest option after i'm done the test i can retest it and it'll generate a new uh, test results and it'll allow me to walk through it again and Uh, th th that's the basic overview, I guess. Um, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't need to get into too much details with it. Uh, I, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm still playing around with it, um, still trying to uh, come up with a good structure for the tests. Um, I, th there's actually still a lot more that needs to be done, particularly uh, surrounding the DAO stuff, um, which is one area that definitely needs needs a lot of testing. Um, so. Um, if you guys wanted to give it a try, um, I think um, either myself or Christoph can uh, set up an account for you guys and you can either just poke around with it or um, give us any uh, feedback or suggestions. Yeah, sounds good to me. Yeah, maybe we should target it for the next release that we will use it for the next release and then get the real experience. Yeah, that, that's going to be my goal for the next uh, few weeks is to, to build up our uh, test suite here so we have something uh, something usable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, sounds great. And um, yeah, next release is 0 0.95. Um, we probably have one or two or three more releases until the DAO is uh, released, I guess. Uh, so yeah, there's some some time to to kind of um, try it out. Yeah, regarding um, testing, um, Manfred, is there something specific you want to to talk about as well? Um, no, I think I don't have anything special to add here. Yeah, so regarding the testing tool, we want to give this a try. Um, um, let's see how it works. Of course, yeah, you, you we only will see it uh, as soon as. Um, people are using it uh, and yeah and thanks Devin a lot uh, for, for setting up uh, everything uh, you did so far it's, it's quite quite a lot of work um, yeah, no yeah cool yeah um, Manfred um, there, there will be uh, from the testing and release part from my side uh, for this dev call um, as, as we don't have the unit testing part um, this week uh, I guess that's it uh, for today, all right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we are already one hour. I don't know if we want to keep talking a little bit about this deterministic build with Gideon and so, uh, or we just keep it for another session later when we have a little bit more uh, uh, knowledge about it. I think at, at the moment, nobody has really deeper knowledge. Or, so I'm not sure if there is much left uh, I mean, it's not a super high priority at the moment. We have many other things at the moment, especially the DAO release and so, where we need to focus on. 
but I think we should keep it in mind. There have been some discussion about a new uh, installation system, uh, which seems to be very popular on, on Linux and so, and then I added basically my comment, yeah, we shouldn't root our energy in such stuff when we want to get basically anyway to a deterministic build and try just to get the right priorities that we're not getting sidetracked to something else, something else which might become more irrelevant or yeah, or, or at least when deterministic build has at the end a higher priority when we are working on this area with release and installation process and so on. So yeah, yeah. So for, for the next releases, um, I, I would focus on on the Windows stuff, the Windows signing. And I personally, I don't have experience with the, the Gideon builds, um, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, actually, I would like to add something. I mean, I know that Devin and Thomas are both very interested and knowledgeable about this deterministic build topic. <clears throat> and of course, it would be great when anybody of you uh, would become more the expert and we are getting there. But on the other side, both of you know already quite a lot about other BISC stuff and can be very helpful. So your time will be missing on other areas. And I would like to take the their chance uh, for getting basically somebody who is already an expert on deterministic build, like the best guy would be probably Def Random. I was once a little bit in contact with him. Uh, and maybe especially when the DAO is live, I mean, it's not the highest priority before the DAO launch. So when the DAO is live, it's much more concrete that he earns directly compensation. We can make it even a bounty uh, and invite him basically for setting up a deterministic build, build for us. He knows already everything, he's the expert there. He get it probably very quickly and we can get him a little bit closer to the project and, yeah, and use it like a bounty to attract a very good developer. So maybe that might be a, yeah in, interesting strategy at least there. But of course, I don't want to stop you guys if you want to get deep into this. Uh, we just should have the right priorities in mind and uh, yeah. At the moment, I think everything which is DAO related has the top priority and uh, we need to keep the other thing a little bit for the future. Um, yeah, let's maybe, uh, Christoph, did you have anything to add? I um, interrupted you a little bit, sorry. No, from, from my part, not. Um, regarding uh, focusing, as I will also now focus more on the DAO, uh, what I just recently found out um, as I looked more into to the, the the indexing of our website and, and the page speed and so on. So there's a lot of uh, improvement possible there as well. I just did, let's say, the 80% of uh, what, um, what what needs to be done to, to speed up our, uh, our website. But yeah, if, if someone is interested um, and, um, and optimize the, the check hill builds, also it, it's not super complicated. You just have to, to uh, Google a little bit around on on Jekyll on speed optimizations or Jekyll on SEO optimizations. Uh, there's a lot of resources available. Um, it just needs to be implemented step by step. Yeah, I just did uh, what I thought um, helps most and uh, and it, it didn't, it wasn't such a big deal. But yeah, if someone um, wants to to take the, the, the last 20% to, to make it really nice, um, that would be great as um, uh, the, the faster our websites are, the the more um, the higher they are ranked on on Google, and and we we do have some some issues on our existing websites. So yeah, so for for the the, the one point zero release, it would be great to have this everything uh, set up properly, so people who want to find us uh, also then find us in the end. Yeah, so that's that's uh, everything from my side. Yeah, great. It seems that we are also, I'm not sure if we, but the ecosystem is a little bit successful to get back the terms of decentralization to those projects who are really decentralized and not those who are just using it for PR. At least Binance uh, uh, had some tweet that they're not using, or it seems that many people complained about their statement that they are adding a decentralized exchange and it's not much decentralized at all. It's just non-custodial. And yeah, they rebranded it in a way and kind of like uh, yeah, discussed a little bit that they are not using it anymore when it's so misunderstood or so. So that's a small victory on that side. Not directly for us, I don't know who started it really, but it seems there have been some discussions on Twitter and some people yeah, complained and it was, this was also always a little bit in, their, in the space with this that basically said, yeah, uh, 
biscuits really decentralized, but you are not, then you shouldn't use this term also. Yeah, that, that, that's good from, uh, from, for us. <laughs> Um, I also saw, so we, we do get some, some organic traffic by people searching for decentralized exchanges, but we're still uh, not so high ranked where we should be, actually. So uh, lots of other decentralized exchanges do a lot of uh, uh, optimizations on the, on the search engine part, so, so they're ranked quite high. So yeah, Hope, hopefully that cleans up uh, naturally over time. And if we have done our job, uh, yeah, it, it, we, we should rank as high as possible and get some some decent traffic uh, from their part as well. Yeah, cool. Goody, uh, yeah, then maybe let's wrap up here. Or does anybody else has anything to add? What do you want to discuss or questions? Not me, I'm good. Maybe a, a little bit of overview about the, the other areas, what's going on. As with Bitcoin J, uh, the, <clears throat> the release with SegWit support uh, will come soon in the next week on Master. We, we will still need more time because we need to review, we need to adjust and uh, tons of API changes. And basically, it's a huge change from the release what we're using currently. So we maybe we do it after the DAO release to not have a big risk at, at the time when we are releasing the DAO and maybe there is some issue with, especially with the DAO wallet or whatever. So I assume it will take maybe two or three months until we can update to uh, Bitcoin Chain Master. And especially yeah, when we would immediately, then we are the beta test and uh, yeah, it's better to wait a little bit until the others find the bugs. <clears throat> uh, but uh, yeah, we will put focus on this and Oscar will work on this, on reviewing and helping testing and so on. As so we put a lot of effort into, into this. Uh, but until we get it really in the application, it will take a little bit of time and we don't really need it because we are not using SegWit. We are not using our, um, yeah, we are, we are not using Lightning for anything. So, so there's not really a hard need for it. But of course, it would be good to get to get all this support. Uh, but it would not justify the risk when we would break something and yeah, wallet get screwed up or whatever, then it uh, would be a big disaster. So we will take our time for getting there. Uh, unfortunately, Greg is still uh, yeah, not uh, available. Uh, he has problems with his uh, spine uh, and I yeah, need to get uh, recovered. <coughs> um, I didn't have time to uh, review the tech spec, uh, but I will do this probably today. And after I've reviewed the tech spec, I will schedule a meeting where we talk about the new trade protocol and we'll invite then everybody to review it as well. So everybody should read at least the tech spec. <coughs> and, but that's maybe then either in one or two weeks. Uh, yeah, for next week, either we, yeah, an uh, important thing is we, we were, uh, yeah, it's a discussion if we should stick with this uh, time slot so Devin can join as well. It's basically the only time uh, when Devin is available for him. I think it's nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, for European time, it's, I think it's 6 uh, p.m., which is also not so terrible bad, hopefully, for most developers. Uh, for you guys, is it a problem when we stick with Tuesday, uh, 6 p.m., European time? For me, it's fine. Yeah, for me too. I have not heard back from Florian yet. Also this week he didn't have time. <clears throat> I hope next week he can join. Let's stick for next week again for this. And depending on Florian, when he has time, maybe we schedule the test testing framework session. Otherwise, maybe the uh, new trade protocol session. Actually, I would like to get the new trade protocol as soon as possible that everybody. It's very important uh, next milestone. And I uh, would like that everybody knows good about this and uh, yeah, to get a deeper review about the concept and so on. So, yeah, yeah we'll, just, we'll have the next yeah. days. <laughs> just one more thing. Um, uh, don't forget to file uh, your compensation requests. So uh, February has less days than January. So that's yeah. just, just, I think, two, two more or three more days left. Uh, yeah until 20, 28th of February. Yeah, the and if you, have, if you have done DAO voting, we are now in the vote reveal phase, so please start up your application again that your vote are uh, yeah, revealing the secret key that the, the other nodes can interpret it and become valid vote. 
and in one or two days it's the uh, result phase maybe we use it a little bit in the growth call um, i don't know yet but uh, uh, it seems so far everything worked fine we will see in the result fa phase if we had any issues again or not hopefully not as when everything went good we will push a little bit harder for the next uh, voting round so that more users are testing out the DAO and are helping us testing it and feedback and so on. And we should set up then some kind like, yeah, testing bounty so everybody who tests the DAO uh, get a reward in BSQ for a compensation request. And I don't know the amount, something like 20 or 50 BSQ. And we should set up a small kind of like a, yeah, and they should give some feedback. So there should be kind of like a small service or, um, feedback uh, page or whatever where they are adding their the feedback and which is required for getting a compensation uh, i don't know if anybody would like to work on this or, or it can be done maybe by steve also i think it doesn't need to be done by a developer but would be good to have this ready uh, the next days when we start the next cycle and when everything went fine beside that i yeah, we'll focus now on trying to get this issue resolved with unconfirmed transaction. That's quite from usability pretty bad. And when we would go live, it would be bad. When people trying to make several offers in a Syria, then they have to wait for a confirmation to have unspent transaction outputs again, because currently uh, BSQ are only validated after they are in the block. Uh, and when you are sending all, when you have only one UTXO and you are using it for a fee payment or whatever, then all your UTXO are spent in this transaction and you have zero BSQ. Uh, and you have to wait for the next block until it gets validated and then you have the available balance again. So that's quite yeah, confusing for the user and, and uh, usability issue when for traders mainly. <clacht> and we would the goal is that we are supporting unconfirmed transaction for your own unspent uh, transaction outputs change outputs so when you are yeah you're making your transaction you receive change outputs there is no reason why you should not trust yourself there's no double spend risk here so you could basically use this bitcoin for the next transaction uh, and without problem and uh it's just a little bit tricky to implement it and i will try to get this uh, before the DAO launch in as well yeah that would be really great yeah i myself i will also now uh start again working on all DAO related issues that are still open so, yeah. yeah and a a, a question also uh, or, or in um would like to ask any, any everybody when he, they found a small bug or whatever, instead of filing a bug report, just fix it when you're a developer, like especially tech stuff or so, instead of yeah, creating an issue for it, it's just maybe not much more work when you make a small pull request for fixing it directly. It's just yeah, speeding up this process because I need to focus on this core issues with the DAO and everything which is on the user front. So I keep for myself low priority so i yeah, put this to the uh to the future and uh, it's probably more efficient when when you try to fix it yourself yeah yeah maybe regarding that uh we can uh, do it also on, on next next week's um developer call just a kind of a best practice on the github uh git process uh as a contributor so there are some tools uh like like github hub um, I, I use on a regular basis and it makes it quite easy and quite fast to to just um, create pull requests uh, new so it, it just makes the process very easy uh, for contribute contributors so uh, if you're interested I could I could show it quickly yeah and regarding this draft uh, feature I also just discovered it and saw it from Devin I think we really should use this for all these pull requests which are work in progress which should be not happen too often anyway or you can share your private repository with somebody when you need feedback or review uh, <clears throat> but sometimes it makes sense <clears throat> to have it more prominent public uh, but yeah we should use this draft then it's uh, easier to handle it and i don't know devin uh, when you have the pull request open and it becomes ready for merge you just can change then the state from draft to a normal pull request, I think, or? Yeah, that's correct. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that uh, should help to avoid unintended merge. I think it's still a good uh, uh, a good best practice to name it with work in progress as prefix and remove it then when it's not work in progress anymore, just to have it easier to spot. One other small thing, I think we didn't succeed still to get less pull requests from altcoins. It's, we are still getting spammed like hell and nearly every day a new request. So this uh, communication that they should make issues and we are picking it up didn't really work. Bernard, maybe you could just clean it up and merge everything and, and just that we are doing the work for them because otherwise it's such a pain and we are getting our list of pull requests uh, polluted with all this altcoin pull requests, which are not really the core stuff what we want to focus. Uh, we just need to get this out of the way in a way. For me, it's really disturbing when I have 20 of the pull requests are, or 19 of 20 are altcoins requests and I'm not interested to look at this at all. Uh, so yeah, yeah, the, I don't know. Yeah, the quick solution is there's a, a filter where you can remove all uh, pull requests that are labeled altcoins. <laughs> That's what I'm, I'm yeah. doing. Yeah, I should add this filter as well. <laughs> But maybe it's also good yeah, to quickly get it merged without waiting until they are perfect because it's such a pain in the ass and so many back and forth. Just uh, <clears throat> fix it for them as long as it's not really critical bugs. And when they are critical bugs and really clear violations of the basic rules, then we reject it and we don't accept it. For, then they are blocked for one month. I think that's already added in the instructions. So when they are, when a test is failing, for instance, such when they never run it, the test it themselves, then they are blocked for a minimum one month. So we are not. The kindergarten for them and uh, and the rest when they're small style and small or uh, imperfections just merge it or, or, or um, merge conflicts or so uh, it's not really their fault when we are merging other stuff in the meantime and so on but uh, it's just a pain in the ass like we have it at the moment the process and it doesn't help us uh, yeah Goody, but uh, Bernard, also for you, as it's not high priority when you don't have time, just leave it. Uh, but when you have time, maybe good to get it cleaned up and get it merged and not wait too long on their help because it's not a good process what we have uh, by trying to educate them to make perfect pull requests. Goody, then uh, let's wrap it up here and I will announce for the next week. Let's stick with uh, 6 o'clock p.m. when there is not a big problem for anybody. And uh, I think it will be probably the next up, it will be the new trade protocol, but I will announce it tomorrow probably. Okay, then see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.